again. So this is a video review of, again, Dangerous Visions, edited by Harlan Ellison. <coughs> so I'm just going to get into my overall opinion of the book. I actually enjoyed this book more than I enjoyed Dangerous Visions, the first one. I think Dangerous Visions is still in print. Well, I think that, again, Dangerous Visions is not still in print. I also think that Dangerous Visions is more widely read today than the sequel, and uh, I think that that's a shame. Uh, there are more big names in Dangerous Visions than in the second one, but the overall quality of the stories was better, and there was a higher percentage of enjoyable and actually dangerous stories. Uh, dangerous Visions really leaned in on being religiously blasphemous, while the second one did not really focus on that nearly as much. Uh, I think there are more big names in the first one, but the second one has some of my all-time favorite authors like Gene Wolfe and Ursula K. Le Guin and uh, Kurt Vonnegut, whereas the only author I'm really obsessive about from Dangerous Visions is J.G. Ballard. Uh, as in, I, I did a video over the first Dangerous Visions and I mentioned this, but Ellison's introductions to each story were again kind of annoying and presumptuous and pretentious. Some of them were kind of useful, but most of them were basically just filler and platforms for Ellison to brag about either being friends with the author or having taught the author supposedly everything they know. Uh, there were more women included in this one, including in this one, included in this one. I found that to be a good thing. Uh, I'm unsure of how many people of color were included, but there were at least two stories written by Jewish authors. Uh, anthologies are always going to be somewhat hit or miss, and I can't think of an in in any anthology where I enjoyed every single story, uh, so keep that in mind as I go over my review. Uh, overall, there are very few misses in this book and a lot of really solid stories. Uh, some of the stories are truly spectacular, however, and the highs of this book are higher than Dangerous Visions or really any other anthology I have ever read. So now I'm going to get into my favorites. Uh, my number one favorite from this book is the novella The Word for World is Forest by Ursula K. Le Guin. My second favorite is also a novella uh, with the Bent Fen Boomer Boys on Little Old New Alabama by Richard A. Lupoff. Lupoff. Uh, my third favorite was Time Travel for Pedestrians by Ray Nelson, which is also a pretty long story. My fourth favorite is A Spot by Gahan Wilson. My fifth favorite was Bed Sheets Are White by Evelyn Leaf. Uh, my sixth favorite was The Big Space Fuck, a great title, by Kurt Vonnegut. My seventh favorite was For Value Received by Andy Offutt. My eighth favorite was Stone Council by H. H. Hollis. My ninth favorite was When It Changed by Joanna Russ. And my tenth favorite was Still Life by Barry N. Malsberg, who was writing as K.M. O'Donnell. Uh, my least favorites were my my number one least favorite was Christ Old Student in a New School, which is a poem by Ray Bradbury. My second least favorite was Toten Boch by Albert Para as A Para E Figueredo. My third least favorite was In the Barn by Piers Anthony. My fourth least favorite was Chuck Berry Won't You Please Come Home by Ken McCullough. And my fifth least favorite was Harry the Hare by James B. Hemasath. So now I'm going to go over each of the individual stories and give them grades and kind of go over my thoughts. So the first story is the keynote story uh, called The Counterpoint of View by John Heidenry. I gave that one a B slash a B plus. Uh, that one's really just a Borges pastiche, uh, which that's a fact that it does wear on the sleeve on its sleeve because it does reference Borges in the story. It's kind of too short to really have much of an impact. It's an odd keynote or introduction, given that there is only one other metafictional story in the book. So you would think that if it was the keynote, there'd be more metafictional stories, but there's only two. Uh, the second story in the anthology is Ching Witch by Ross Ricklin. I gave that one a B slash a B plus. I felt like it was a solid story. It seems like a commentary on youth culture in the late 60s and early 70s and also a commentary on how quickly fads can pass. It kind of does read like old guy wish fulfillment, old white guy wish fulfillment, though. The third story uh, in the anthology is The Word for World is Forest uh, by Ursula K. Le Guin. I gave that one an A slash an A+. 
I did do a standalone video for this novella, which you can find on my channel. I had read it once before, separate from, again, Dangerous Visions. At heart, it's really just a, pe a piece of protest literature that seems to really go in on and condemn the Vietnam War. It's almost like a companion piece to her novel, The Lathe of Heaven. Uh, you can check out my other video for more about that book. The fourth story in the anthology is For Value Received by Andy Offutt. I gave that one an A minus slash an A. It's about a girl being born in the hospital. She lives in the same hospital she was born in until she is in her 20s because her parents found their hospital bill to be exorbitant and refused to pay it, so she's not allowed to leave. It's definitely a send up of health insurance and non socialized health care and how ridiculous health care costs can be in the US in this country. The fifth story is Mathems from the Time Closet by Gene Wolfe. Uh, I gave that one a B plus slash an A minus. It's, uh, it's three different flash fiction pieces. The first is Robot Story. The second is Against the Lafayette Escadrille. And the third is Loco Parentis. Like I said, it's three flash fiction pieces. They all deal with time travel in one way or another. That being said, the stories read more like literary fiction rather than sci-fi. It's the stories are pretty typical for Wolf. They're literary and inventive, but um, they're not as spectacular as some of his other books and stories. So I didn't grade it as high. The sixth story is Time Travel for Pedestrians by Ray Nelson. Gave that one an A minus slash an A. I found this one to be a fucking trip. Uh, it's super trippy and very dangerous. I have to imagine that this story caused quite a stir when it came out. It seems to describe a drug trip caused by something like Datura or Morning Glory Seeds, which are both very strong delirians. I don't have any personal experience with either of them. Uh, the narrator jumps around in time, experiencing a variety of different scenarios. Uh, the scenarios mainly focus on various types of Western and Christian mysticism. I've seen it described as, past, as a depiction of past life regression, but that fact is not clear in the story. It's a mixture of a, of a druggy montage and with spiritual exploration. I do wish this one was a novel-length story. Uh, apparently, Ray Nelson wrote the story, which is a separate story, but the story that They Live, the movie, is based on. I really love They Live. It's probably my favorite John Carpenter movie. Uh, the seventh story or part of the anthology is Christ, Old Student in a New School, which is a poem by Ray Bradbury. I gave that one a straight up F. Uh, I didn't even finish that one. I questioned why a poem was even included. It doesn't seem to fit with the rest of it. I didn't understand this one at all. The eighth story is King of the Hill by Chad Oliver. I gave that one a B slash a B plus. It does seem to predict climate change and some of the effects of climate change, but it's only somewhat prescient. The story concerns overpopulation and rampant extinction. The story is kind of meandering. Uh, I did find it inventive and well executed, though. And the ninth story is The Ten O'Clock Report is Brought to You By by Edward Bryant. I gave that one a B slash a B plus. The story is about a news station paying to be the first to report a story by paying criminals to commit crimes and then documenting the crimes the criminals are paid to commit. Uh, there is a gang rape scene in this story, uh, that which is quite haunting. Um, the story seems like a precursor to movies and other stuff like Nightcrawler. Uh, it's one of the more dangerous visions in the book. The tenth story is The Funeral by Kate Wilhelm. I gave that one a B plus slash an A minus. I found this story to be fairly mysterious and difficult to pin down. It seems like a reaction to the hippie youth movement, and it also seems like a parody of the 1950s in America. What I've read of Wilhelm, she seems like she was pretty influential in the sci-fi genre. Uh, I taught a Wilhelm story about a year ago. The 11th story is Harry the Hare by James P. Hemisath. Gave that one a C plus slash a B minus. It's a piece of flash fiction. It seems like an ode to cartoons and also a commentary on copyright law. I was kind of unsure what was going on in this story. There is some gore and violence, but it's not a particularly dangerous vision. The twelfth story is When It Changed by Joanna Russ. Uh, this one won the, no the Nebula Award for Best Short Story. I gave that one a B plus slash an A minus. Uh, the story concerns a colonized planet where men have gone extinct, and there have been only women on the planet for hundreds of years. Men from Earth show up and they fuck up the status quo. 
The story kind of subverts the expectations of someone who has just heard the summary, though. Uh, the women are kind of angry that the men show up and don't act like they're like relieved or that they need men at all. The 13th story is The Big Space Fuck by Kurt Vonnegut. I gave that one an A- slash an A. The tone and the plot of this story are very Vonnegut. Uh, in that kind of Vonnegut way, it's like it's almost logical, but not quite. It's about Earth going to shit and humanity trying to artificially inseminate the universe. Uh, the story reminded me of Ariana Grande's song, NASA, which is probably my favorite song by her. Although I'm not an, an, uh, an expert on Ariana Grande's discography. The 14th story is Bounty by T.L. Sherrod. Uh, that one I gave a B slash a B plus. Uh, B slash B plus is, is, a, is pretty much the rule for this for this. Uh, for this for this anthology, I gave out B and B pluses a lot. Uh, so Bounty is about vigilantism being legalized and rewarded monetarily. So people bait each other into committing crimes that they can then be rewarded for violently stopping. People also kill themselves so that their family will get paid. Uh, it's short and disturbing and definitely misanthropic. Uh, the fifteenth story is Still Life by Barry N. Malsberg who, like I said earlier, was writing as K.M. O'Donnell. I gave that one a B plus slash an A minus. Uh, that story is about an, uh, an astronaut slowly going crazy and eventually leaving two of his fellow astronauts on the moon and just going back to Earth and stranding the other astronauts on the moon, where they presumably die. Uh, the main character rapes his wife in the opening of the story, which is pretty hard to read. Uh, the main character is basically a villain, short-tempered and self-centered. Uh, it seems like a commentary on how bureaucracy drives you crazy, as the main character really doesn't like that NASA tells him not to swear during his mission to the moon. The 16th story is Stone Council by H.H. H. Hollis. I gave that one a B plus slash an A minus. Uh, this story is trippy and vivid and super inventive. It reminded me of an adult version of Adventure Time, uh, the TV show. It's about two lawyers doing drugs and then mind melding as they fight over a <coughs> over a legal case. It's kind of almost a climate fiction story as well. Seventeenth story is Monitored Dreams and Strategic Cremations by Bernard Wolf. That's two different stories: uh, the Bisquit position and the girl with rapid eye movements. I gave that one a B slash a B plus. Uh, these two stories are connected by them both having the same main character. The first story is about a rich journalist helping a woman with a husky cheat on her husband. The husband is heavily tied up in the military industrial complex. Uh, the husky accidentally dies in a demonstration of the effects of, of napalm. That story reminded me of Joan Didion's novel Play It As It Lays, which is definitely my favorite thing that Didion wrote that I've read. The second story is concerned with incomprehensible rock lyrics and how dreams affect reality. It seems to parody songs like Inagata da Vida. Uh, the story is much more playful and absurd than the first story. Both stories seem to protest the Vietnam War and to protest capitalism in general. Uh, some parts of the second story are, are really hilarious. The 18th story is With a Finger in My Eye by David Gerald. I gave that one a B slash a B plus, uh, maybe a B minus slash a B. It's a lot like Borges's Talon Ukbar. Uh, it concerns a mass hysteria and hallucinations and how the quirks of our perceptions color the world around us. It's kind of too peculiar to it's kind of too peculiar to be incisive and it's also rather unfocused. The 19th story is in the barn by Piers Anthony. Uh, that one I gave a C plus such a B minus. That one is definitely definitely a dangerous vision, although not really in a good way. It's pretty damn disgusting. It's basically about vegetarianism and veganism and how we would never treat humans like we treat uh, how we never treat humans like we treat livestock. It kind of reminded me of Michelle Faber's uh, Under the Skin, uh, the, the book, not the movie. The twentieth story is Soundless Evening by Lee Hoffman. I gave that one yet another B slash B plus. It's a solid story and rather innocuous. It's basically about a society with limits on how many children you can have. Children you can have. You can still have as many babies as you want, but they are killed at the age of five if you have more than two. It's kind of too short and low stakes to really affect you emotionally, which you would think it would considering it, it concerns children dying. 
The 21st Story is a spot by Gahan Wilson, who's a famous cartoonist. I gave that one an A minus slash an A. It was really fucking good. It was inventive and silly and absurd. A simple idea, but it's very well executed. It's basically about a spot on a wall growing and eventually consuming everything. I almost gave it an A slash an A plus, but it's just a bit too short to have that kind of impact. The 22nd story is The Test Tube Preachers Afterwards by jo- Joan Bernat. Give that one a B slash a B plus. That one's pretty short. It's probably flash fiction. It's about a gen- genetically engineered pet that either causes or stops its owner's suicide. Uh, the story reeks of depression and anhedonia. It's definitely a dangerous vision. The 23rd story is And the Sea Like Mirrors by Gregory Benford. Gave that one a B slash a B plus, although I it came pretty close to a B plus slash A minus, but it was just way too misogynistic. It's stated to be a response to Heinlein's book, Combatant Man. It reminded me of this show, Yellow Jackets, and books like The Karchi Rain by Avram Davidson, which I did a, a whole video over. Uh, the story is a literary thriller, kind of light sci-fi. It explores madness and toxic masculinity. The 24th story is Bed Sheets Are Right by or White by Evelyn Leaf. Give that one an A minus slash an A. That one reminded me of the, the book The Long Walk by Richard Bachman slash Stephen King. It is, hallucin- it is very hallucinatory and it's very much of its time. Uh, some of it seems to be about white nationalism. Some of it seems to be a dream sequence. It's short and sweet and has no excess language. It seems like it's a memory, but it couldn't be as the world of the story is completely alien. That one I saw being specified by a reviewer as being bad, but I really loved it. The 25th story is Tissue by James Solis. It comprises the stories at the Fitting Shop and 53rd American Dream. I gave that one a B slash a B minus slash a B. I thought that they were just fine. The first story is about a teenage boy getting lost in a department store as he shops for a new penis. The second story is about the highs and lows of parenting. There's a lot of shock value and subversion in that one. The 26th story is Eloise and the Doctors of the Planet Pergamon by Josephine Saxton. I gave that one a B plus slash an A minus. It's a haunting and disgustingly visceral story. Uh, It kind of reminded me of the works of J.G. Ballard as it's the closest thing to the atrocity exhibition I've ever read besides maybe Gravity's Rainbow. It's about a perfectly healthy woman on a planet where everyone has grotesque disabilities and horrible illnesses. It also reminded me of, of the plays of Samuel Beckett. The 27th story is Chuck Berry, Won't You Please Come Home by Ken McCullough. I gave that one a C plus slash a B minus. It's kind of too low stakes for me. Not really dangerous, not really sci-fi. It's about a guy growing a tick to a humongous size. It's very stylized and repetitive. Uh, the 28th story is Epiphany for Aliens by David Kerr. I gave that one a B slash a B plus. It's about a team of scientists that discover a group of Neanderthals that are still alive in Europe. The story has its own logic. Uh, the woman who sacrifices herself for science in the story seems like a stand-in for bleeding heart liberal types. Uh, the story is perhaps somewhat racist. 29th uh, is the story Eye of the Beholder by Burt K. Filer. I gave that one a B slash a B plus. It's about an artist who creates sculptures that are mathematically impossible as they defy the rules of gravity. The CIA and a female scientist are quite interested in creating an interstellar engine out of the sculptures, out of like the principles of the science of the sculptures. It reminded me of some of Ballard's early stories and it explores the differences between art and science. The 30th story is Moth Race by Richard Hill. I'll give that one a B plus slash an A minus. Uh, that story is seemingly about a utopia where everyone is given everything they need by the government. A man goes to watch a race where the drivers have to survive racing around a track with randomly generated obstacles. The only one to ever conquer the track is called the champion and he lives like a modern celebrity. Uh, The main character is part of the race's audience and at the end he drunkenly tries to participate in the race. The 31st story is In Re Glover by Leonard Tushnet. I give that one a B slash a B plus. I thought it was solid and kind of vaguely funny, uh, comedic but not hilarious. It was somewhat Kafka-esque in that it portrays endless and convoluted bureaucracies. It is more or less about the legal ramifications of cryogenesis technology, 
I feel like it could have been more in depth. The thirty second story by is by Ben Bova. Gave that one a B minus slash a B. It's about a male astro- astronaut trying to be the first be- human being to have sex in outer space. The woman he is supposed to fuck is a time life photographer, a civilian in a NASA space station. It's too long and technical and meandering. It's not very exciting as a story. The 33rd story is A Mouse in the Walls of the Global Village by Dean R. Kuntz. That one I gave a B slash a B plus, and that's the only thing I've ever read by Kuntz. I didn't actually realize he wrote sci-fi. I thought he just wrote horror. Uh, The story is about a world where almost everyone can communicate telepathically, and it centers on one of the few humans who has to communicate normally. His life is quite hellish as he is beat up and abused for making sounds. The narrator sometimes can't stop himself from screaming and crying. It's a, it's a visceral and horrifying story. The 34th story, 34th story is Getting Along by James Blish and Judith Ann Lawrence. I gave that one a B slash a B plus. It's a series of nine letters detailing a woman's super odd family and her search for a home. It apparently parodies nine or ten different genre fiction authors, uh, but I wouldn't have realized that if not for El- Ellison's intro to the story. The concept and the, and the idea of this story are better than the actual execution. It seems somewhat random and weird for the sake of being weird. The 35th story is T- Totenbuch by Albert Parra as A. Parra E. Figueredo. I gave that one a D plus slash a C minus. I didn't understand this story at all. I found it confusing and faux deep and random and unfocused. I had no idea what was going on or what I was supposed to take away from the story. The 36th story is Things Lost by Thomas M. Dish. That one I gave a B plus slash an A minus. I didn't understand what the point of the story was necessarily, but I do know I enjoyed it a lot. It's about a generation ship populated by old, immortal people. It's ostensibly the journal of a scientist whose claim to fame is mapping the genome of mice. Um, He's an amateur author who wants to start writing a novel. Uh, There's a lot of references to Prowse in this story. It's kind of breezy and low stakes. Sorry, I need some water. Um, The 37th story is with the Benfen Boomer Boys on Little Old New Alabama. That's a novella by Richard A. Lupoff. I gave that one an A minus slash an A. I did really, really hate this story at first, but I grew to truly love it. I didn't understand Ellison comparing it to the Riders of the Purple Wage from the first Angel of Visions until I got a while into the story, but and I actually did find that that's a pretty good comparison for the story. Parts of it are written in a mixture of good old boy talk and phonetic spelling like in F- Finnegan's Wake. It's basically about a war between the planets New Alabama and New Haiti, although there's a lot more details than that, as there are zombies and there's also some Avatar-type stuff. It's a supremely odd story, but it is super inventive and consistently surprising. The 38th story is Lamia Mutable by M. John Harrison. Gave that one a B- slash a B. I'm not sure I understood this story. It seems somewhat random, but also apocalyptic. Uh, it's just okay as a story, maybe too referential and reliant on illusions for me. I, I was kind of disappointed by this story as I've heard really good things about M. John Harrison and I was expecting a lot. The 39th story is Last Train to Kankakee by Robin Scott. Oops, by Robin Scott. It's about a con artist who dies and gets frozen and then reincarnated. He can't find a purpose for his life and he kills himself multiple times, but he eventually succeeds. His cells are then spread into the universe. It's kind of solid and low stakes. Uh, It does mention rape and murder. The 40th story is Empire of the Sun by Andrew Weiner. Give that one a B plus slash an A minus. It's a hallucinatory montage that plays by all its own rules. It's about a man drafted into a war on Mars where he is really just fighting other conscripts from Earth. The war might be meant to lower Earth's population. Parts of the story are a dream sequence, I think. I'm not 100% on that, but I, it's a solid story. The 41st story, 41st story is Ozymandias by Terry Carr. Give that one a B slash a B plus. Uh, it concerns post-apocalyptic tomb raiders journeying to an area like the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Uh, once they're there, they loot a vault. 
I didn't necessarily understand why this one was so long and why some of some stuff was included. There were some pretty cool details in there, though. It's a pretty solid story. Uh, the 42nd story is The Milk of Paradise by James Tiptree Jr. Gave that one a B slash a B plus. Uh, I feel similarly about this one, like as pretty much the same as how I felt about the story by the author included in the book Nova 2, if you've read that. Uh, that story is, and I've come upon this place by most by lost ways. I felt like the story was solid and pretty good, not amazing, and I'm not sure I fully understood it. I think it's about a human slave revealing the name and location of its homeworld. Uh, the people who got that info go to the homeworld and are disappointed, so they end up killing the slave. I feel like there should have been more description and more world building in this story. Uh, so now I'm going to give you my overall grade for the book. I gave it a B plus slash an A minus. Uh, it's the same grade as I gave Dangerous Visions, but I did like this one more. This one was more on the A minus side, whereas I would think Dangerous Visions was more on the B plus side. Uh, thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe and watch my other videos. Uh, have a good day.